Well, in uh, 2007, I took a job uh, teaching on the island of Trinidad in the Caribbean, and I was there for a year. And in that year, uh, there's not a lot to do on the island of Trinidad. It's not the pretty part of the Caribbean. And I was told not to leave my apartment without a bodyguard, literally. And they hired this great big man to be my bodyguard. And I was very self-conscious going anywhere with him because uh, I was told I was a target anywhere I went. So I sp I, the point is I ended up spending a lot of time sitting in my apartment surfing the web. And I had not really had any uh, much involvement in anything on the web, certainly not with me contributing anything. And I f don't remember specifically how I found ThailandStories.com, but I came across this website that uh, was all about people writing uh, about Thailand, either fiction or nonfiction. And I, was in, I am still interested in both. And some of the writing, the, the, the quality of the writing was very uneven. Everybody there, including myself, was a hobby writer. But the quality was kind of uneven. But even if, if somebody was a, a, a novice writer, what they were writing about, I was very interested in. And so I started to contribute uh, some stories. I've been writing about Thailand ever since I first came here in 1988. Uh, even and maybe even more when I was not actually physically able to be here. So having an outlet for my writing about Thailand and having an audience that was interested in writing about Thailand, and there was of course a comment section, so you got a lot of attention. You met people you, who, who you never actually met, but you got to know them very well. And it became a daily thing, either contributing or reading what was contributed there. It was a very active site. It was run by a man named Mike Seberg, uh, who was living, I think, in Surin uh, at that time, and uh, had been there a long time and was married and, and had deep, deep roots in Thailand. And his thrust, his goal was to, you know, uh, paint a, a picture of his adopted home that would express how grateful he was to live there. So a lot of the writing was glowing, a lot of the writing was about the fun parts of Thailand, and a lot of it wasn't. And there were people there who were famous in a fairly small uh, community, but really famous within that community. There was a guy named Dana, who had been coming uh, to Thailand on business and for pleasure for many, many years. He never lived here which is interesting because he wrote more than 400 essays about Thailand in his lifetime. And it is available, it was collected at one point into a book, and it, that anthology is available online somewhere. And he never wrote under any other name than Dana, and that was his real name, but he never revealed his last name. And Dana was somebody who enjoyed the bar scene very, very, very much. And he wrote very detailed, loving descriptions of his encounters and his, his adventures, uh, particularly in Padia. Uh, he just adored Padia, and he knew every street, every street corner, every bar. And he was a very opinionated, large personality, a small man with a very large personality. And this was, you know, a lot of people, a lot of men who vacation in Thailand don't get to talk about it with their family or their co-workers. And this was ThailandStories.com uh, became a place where guys got to talk about it. And uh, there was Dana, there was a guy named Korsky, wrote under the name Korsky. He was uh, a guy named Dick Samansky, who was a college professor in California. And uh, he was a, a, a geographer by profession, that was his PhD, and he got to travel a lot as a geographer. And uh, the Philippines and Thailand, he had written academic papers about these places, about the sociology, the social sciences of the commercial sex industry, and he would approach it with this very clinical, analytical, scholarly kind of voice. But at the same time, the things he was describing were the things that any yabo on a bar stool can describe to you, but they were being described to you by a man with a PhD and an incredible command of language. And uh, 
between them and me and the other people on that site, we had a, a, a very rust, robust uh, conversation going, and that lasted for many years. And I think eventually it was the comment section that killed it. You know, I think eventually people became more interested in slagging each other off in the comments than they were in writing. And uh, it, it is now defunct. I think it has been taken down. Uh, but boy, there was a golden age there, maybe 2000, and, well, I discovered it in 2007. I don't know when Mike launched it. But uh, between 2007 and maybe 2010, 2011, uh, that was a really uh, happening site. I was active in uh, thailandstories.com and the reader submission section of the Stickman blog. And that was, that was what we had available. There was no YouTube yet. People weren't carrying video cameras in their pocket. So it was all prose and some poetry. Uh, and I think there were people contributing plays or, and film scripts. Uh, those were the two that I participated in. I checked in a few times with Thaivisa.com, but that place was just too antagonistic and aggressive and mean and nasty. Uh, I, I never, I don't think I contributed at all, ever, to any of the forum, in, uh, anything any, under that forum. Uh, I think the two that I was most involved with were, were thailandstories.com and the reader's submissions of the Stickman blog. Well, there was uh, a golden age of, of, of self-publishing. When it first started, there were a whole community of people who had been writing about Thailand and searching for agents and searching for publishers and being turned down by the gatekeepers of traditional legacy publishing uh, at every turn. And we all had manuscripts in our bottom right-hand drawer of our desk that we had pimped out to dozens of sources and nobody would nibble. Nobody would publish our work. And then all of a sudden there, was, there were these platforms where you could, and you had always been able, you could go, there was the Vanity Press forever, you know, going back hundreds of years, you could go and pay a print house just to print your, your book and get an artist, pay an artist to do a cover. And you, if you wanted to spend that money, you could get a hundred copies that you could give to your relatives and your friends. And, and that was where that was until suddenly there was online print on demand publishing and then eventually Kindle uh, or e-reader uh, publishing. And everybody, it was like this huge cathartic explosion of, oh my God, I can get my words out and people will read it and they will, there's a place where they can post a review of my book and they say nice things about me. And I get a terribly detailed accounting of how many books I've sold and even the ones I got paid in Indian rupees and Japanese yen and everything else. And that part, the auditing of sales had always been a bugaboo for authors, I mean famous authors to, to first time short story writers. Getting an accurate representation from a legacy publishing house of how many copies you actually sold and further getting paid for all those copies was always heartache. And with online print on demand publishing or e-reader publishing, Man, they just dropped it in your PayPal account every month. And, and there was what we have to assume and still assume is and was a, 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 an accurate accounting of sales. And it changed the landscape. All of a sudden, uh, you put the word Thailand into the search bar in Amazon and hundreds of titles would come up. And a lot of them were done by a retiree who spent his days in a bar stool or, or in, his, in his house waiting for the sun to go down so that he could walk down the, the lane to the local bar and uh, had a lot of time on his hands. Most retirees have a lot of time on their hands. And uh, he had a word processor and he would write a book, you know, Thai Bar Girls 101, what you need to know uh, to, to, to enjoy the commercial sex industry in Thailand which is silly because it's an industry with 700 years of research and development invested in creating a process 
that's accessible to and not frightening to every tourist who gets off an airplane. And the idea that you might need a manual of 150 pages of how to go to the Tilak bar and pay a bar fine is, is, is ludicrous. But a lot of guys, it is so overwhelming you know, to men who, who, for whatever reasons, were lonely back home, they get here and there's this wonderful simulation of friendship and affection and there's noise and light in the bars and there's alcohol and all of these people calling you a handsome man. And, it, you know, you get googly, you, 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 you get lightheaded and stunned by it. And a lot of men's reaction to that is to sit down at a keyboard and say, I want to share with you what I've learned. You know, I'm going to give you a peek behind the veil. They've been here six months, you know, but they're going to share all their old Asia hand wisdom with you. And so many of the books were that. And of course, if you title a book, How to Get a Free Bee Job in Padia, you're going to sell thousands of copies. If it's a titillating, a sensational title, you're going to sell a lot of copies. And then that's going to spur you to write a second book. The rest of the things you need to know about Tilak Bar. And so the, the market very quickly became flooded with that. And the downside is that there are some very, very good books about Thailand out there. Some very wonderful authors have written about this place. And you could spend your whole life reading and never read them all, but they get pushed off the shelf. They get pushed off the top page the first page and the citations in Amazon, if you put the word Thailand in the search bar, all of these salacious titles come up first. So things like A Woman of Bangkok or Borderlines by Charles Nickel or, or uh, My Pandrai Means Never Mind by Carol Hollinger, all the classics, all the really good writing gets pushed uh, to the back. And that's an unfortunate side effect of the democratization of the publishing industry. I, I don't know enough about the new media, about YouTube, I'm just learning about that now, but something I have noticed is because YouTube tries to be family friendly, you don't see any videos that are titled How to Get a Free Bee Job in Padia, even though that would draw a million views, just that title. And then you could, you could present your favorite recipe for Pad Thai, and, but because of that title, you would get a million views. YouTube uh, discourages that sort of thing, particularly if you want to monetize your channel. So what we tend to see, rather than the salacious stuff flooding the market, we see really bland, generic crap. You know, some guy puts a GoPro on his forehead and he rides his little step through motorcycle through 30, mi 30 kilometers of road in Pizzanulo or, or Nakon Nayok or somewhere, and that's his video. Or he, he says, this is my favorite place to get breakfast. There was one I watched where the guy made tea. He said, this is how I make tea every morning in my house in Thailand. Well, it's hot water and leaves. It's the same recipe, whether you're doing it at home in London or you're doing it in Thailand. But that's his video. Part of that is driven by the need to produce a video once a week. If you've got a channel, you've got subscribers, you want to monetize, you have to be regular, boom, 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 boom. Your subscribers have to be able to expect a video from you every Wednesday or every Tuesday. And so sometimes all of us, any creative, you get stuck with a deadline and you don't know what to make. So you, uh, you visit the local temple, which is just like all the other temples in Thailand. You, you make merit with your, your wife or your girlfriend or whoever, which is just like making merit every other holy day in the year in any temple in Thailand. But that's your video this week. And there are dozens and dozens and dozens of people doing that, and it's all very bland and generic and uninteresting to me. Uh, and then you get the uh, professional uh, uh, digital nomads who say, I'm in Thailand this month. Next month, I'll be in Sri Lanka. Month after that, I'll be in Vietnam. But here's what's happening my month in Thailand. And these guys start shooting the moment they get off the plane. And they t here's me checking into a guest house. Oh, look at the bathroom. The toilet is just a hole in the floor. <gasps> yeah, well, sure it is. You know, and that's what you're going to find in Sri Lanka and Vietnam as well. So there's a lot of that. There's not a lot of attempt at individuality, uniqueness, creativity. 
our genre, our field as represented in YouTube is, is lacking in people taking risks, in people trying to create, you know, dare I say it, art. Maybe art with a capital A is too much to hope for, but certainly creativity, certainly wit, charm, lightheartedness, uh, telling a story, narrative. Narrative is, there's zero narrative in our genre uh, in YouTube. Uh, nobody is trying to tell a story. Everybody is just documenting what they're doing today. I'm going to go to Kaosan Road and show you how Kaosan Road is surviving COVID. And he takes his GoPro and he walks down Kaosan Road. Oh, look, here's a store that last year was selling postcards. This year it's not selling postcards. And that's it. That's his content. Yeah, bites are free. Uh, it used to be. Uh, in fact, the first, uh, the first movie, the first feature film I ever worked on in New York was called uh, She's Gotta Have It. I worked on, in the art department on one uh, uh, scene in that movie, which is in black and white. The rest of the movie is in color. This one scene's shot in black and white. That's because the director, Spike Lee, was working in the NYU Film Lab. He was a graduate student there. His, his, his work-study job was developing other students' film. And they used to have what was called short ends. You had 50 yards of film on a canister in a magazine, and you would, your scene would take 20 of those yards. So you, would, you could shoot two scenes, burn up 40, feet of, uh, 40 yards of film, then you had 10 yards left over. You didn't want to start the scene again because you would run out of film in the middle of it, so you would send that can to the developing lab. They would cut off that unused 10 feet of film, 10 yards of film, and give it back to you. Spike didn't do that. He kept all the short ends and made his first movie with stolen film. There is a black and white scene in the middle of that movie simply because he happened to have three magazines, I think, of black and white film. Well, today, none of that serendipity happens. None of that kismet happens because bites are free. You, filming something on video costs you literally nothing. Once you've purchased your camera or you simply use the camera in your phone, that's it. All your film is free because you don't have film. You don't have to pay for the developing of the film, the shipping of the film, the storing of the film in a refrigerated container. None of that. So what you get is people shooting lots and lots and lots of empty, meaningless stuff simply because they don't have to pay for it. They don't have to plan. They don't have to budget. And they don't have to invest creativity. And all they have to do is press, you know, go. And, and they're going. And they'll, and they'll film that. And they'll stick that in their, their video. And stuff that isn't even qualified to be B-roll becomes the main thrust of this week's video on this channel. <laughs> having having uh, uh, disrespected uh, the medium of YouTube here for 10 minutes, I'll tell you that like everybody else, I have a channel and I'm trying to produce content. I'm learning new words. I'm trying to produce content uh, that's worthwhile and watchable. In that vein, uh, a young man named Roy Bott uh, has asked if we can collaborate on a short film uh, based on a short story in one of my books. The book is called She Kept the Bar Between Them. The story is called Necessary Things. And we're going to try to turn that short story, it's about a 10,000 word short story, we're going to try to turn that into a, I think, about a 10 minute film. And I'm very excited about it. My degrees in theater, I worked in the film industry in New York City for well, the Reagan administration, eight years. I have a background in the performing arts. I have a, a real interest in the performing arts, but that has never been available unless you owned a studio in Hollywood. You, you know, most of us were not able to produce a film. And so I'm very excited about that. <clears throat> we're gonna try to get it done. I'm in Bangkok at the moment. And for the first time, I have come here to live. I, I, I've come in the last 20 years three times as a tourist, and I used to live here in the 90s. And since we left in 97, I've been telling myself, I'm gonna come back here. And I have, four days ago. And uh, already have a film project. Now this is not, uh, 
This is not a project that's going to pay me a lot of money or perhaps any money, but it's, it's ego gratification, it's, it's recognition of my work, it's a chance to reinterpret a piece I wrote, a story I wrote in 2009, and which I have come to think is full of a lot of self-indulgent writing, it's way too long, uh, it tries to address too many themes, well, here's an opportunity to cut out all of the, the useless or, or not as necessary stuff and really whittle it down to the essence, to 10 minutes of essence of that piece of creativity and reimagine it in a new iteration in a new medium. And that, to me, that's really, really exciting. And I am grateful to Roy Bott, and I'm grateful to YouTube. Uh, I'm grateful to the age we live in. I'm happy that I have lived long enough to see a time when amateurs uh, uh, can, can really get their teeth into stuff and, and create content.